uh, we are having Dr. Sanabar Sharif. She will be presenting on the topic, the role of insulin resistance and glucose intolerance among patients with Parkinson's disease. Good evening to one and all present here. Thank you, Ms. Ghazal, for the introduction. I'm very excited to be a part of this conference today, and I hope we have a fruitful and productive session. As we all know, Parkinson's disease can be of many pathognomic types. We generally classify it into four types. The first type is the primary or the idiopathic Parkinson's disease. The second is the Parkinson's syndrome. The third is the secondary Parkinson's disease. And the fourth is the familial neurodegenerative diseases. Um, we all know that it is due to the accumulation of alpha synuclein protein. And it generally begins in the pars compacta of the substantia nigra, where the dopaminergic neurons are affected. And in this picture, you can clearly see that in a normal person and in a Parkinson's disease patient, you can see the changes in the substantia nigra where the dopaminergic neurons are affected. This, is to, this picture is to show us that the various pathways, uh, most importantly, the negostriatal pathway of the dopaminergic system are affected. And this leads to an affection of voluntary movements, which is the reason why there is an issue in coordinating voluntary movements in these patients. And now we come to the five stages of Parkinson's disease. As you can see, stage one involves only one side of the body. And stage 1.5, as we, uh, in today's world, we have come to discard these stages, but this is the historical uh, memory in which we have stage 1.5, where we have unilateral and axial involvement. Stage two involves bilateral symptoms, but no impairment of balance. Stage 2.5 will include mild bilateral disease with full recovery on the full test. Stage three includes mild to moderate disease, and they are physically independent still. But in stage four, we can see severe disability, and we cannot um, expect the patients to stand or walk unassisted. On stage five, uh, we have wheelchair bound or bedridden unless assisted. So this is the progression of the symptoms and the stages of the Parkinson's disease. Um, contrary to popular uh, research papers, it has been shown in the field of clinical medicine that uh, diagnosing Parkinson's disease in early stages is a very difficult task because there are a bunch of prodromal symptoms apart from the main symptoms that all of us know. Like uh, the most common symptoms include the tremor of the hands even at rest or shuffling gait as we call it where uh, the person walks in unbalanced small steps and the feet are curved in a characteristic way. Apart from this, we have other signs and symptoms like uh, low mood, a softer voice, um, different kinds of aphasia or problems in speech, bradykinesia, which means slowness of movement, tremors, sexual dysfunction, and a characteristic sign, which is called Parkinsonian mask, which means the lack of facial expressions in these kind of patients. It also involves drooling, cogwheel rigidity, and shuffling gait, as we already have spoken about. And these are the early signs of Parkinson's disease. Well, speaking from an epidemiological point of view, Parkinson's generally occurs after the age of 65 commonly, but nowadays we can see a lot more cases between the age of 30 to 50. And many such uh, research and scientific papers are attributing the reason for the early um, onset of this disease due to environmental toxins, which we will talk about a few minutes later. But as you can see in this poster, uh, apart from the symptoms that we've discussed, we can also see some others like loss of smell, 
which is also called hyposmia, soft or low voice, trouble sleeping and stooping or hunching over. So this should serve as a guidance for us to maybe notice such symptoms in people around us for early diagnosis. And in this picture, you can see the handwriting changes before the administration of levodopa and after. This kind of handwriting is also called micrographia. I mean, uh, the one before the levodopa, where the letters are small and scrunched together. And we can see that the handwriting changes are one of the earliest changes. And in this, we can see the picture, the graphical representation where dopamine level in normal neurons and in the case of affected neurons, it's less, but it's, uh, it's a gross oversimplification of the pathogenetic mechanisms which we will discuss, but this is what you should know, that there is low dopamine in these pathways. Now we can talk about the risk factors which involve both genetic, both environmental and other factors. So in the case of gender, we see a prevalence of male over female. And in the case of age, as we already discussed, it's uh, above the age of 65 more commonly. And as it might come as a shock to most of you, there are certain protective risk factors in the sense that smoking and caffeine are considered to be protective in the case of Parkinson's disease, which we will see now. But exposure to high dairy and milk intake is actually a potential risk factor. So we can see in this picture how we have high cholesterol levels or low urate levels, which are potential risk factors in the mechanism of pathogenesis. In this picture on the side, we can see the anatomical changes in the lobules, especially in the midbrain. And now to talk about the balancing of the two factors. So in this case of the genetic causal factors, we can clearly see that pesticides, which counts as environmental toxins, intake of dairy, any kind of cancer and traumatic brain injury can lead to an increased incidence of the genetic causal effects. Whereas uh, the inverse risk factors, which are contradictorily positive in this case. So we can see smoking, caffeine, urate, physical activity, ibuprofen, and calcium channel blockers in the case of Parkinson's disease. Now, we uh, mostly we think that the etiology of the Parkinson's disease is idiopathic, but we can identify this is, uh, we can identify a few theories. The first theory can be the dual hit theory, where genetically susceptible individuals, when exposed to toxins or exposed to certain conditions, like a traumatic brain injury, can lead to the disease. Or we can see that uh, increase in the reactive oxygen species or the misfolded alpha synuclein, which can behave in a prion like manner. So either we have um, a, some neurotropic virus which enters the brain through the nose or through the GIT and behaves in a virus destructive manner, destructing these um, parts of the brain which are affected with, which are concerned with voluntary movement, or we can have the accumulation of the misfolded protein aggregates, alpha synuclein. And this can lead to the formation of Lewy's bodies, which are commonly known and these behave in a prion-like manner. So we can see that uh, despite the striatal dopaminergic neurons uh, are considered to be the most vulnerable part of a CNS. And this is because of the fact that even though brain is 2% of the body's weight, it tends to take up more than 20% of the body's energy level, even at the stage of resting. And if within the brain, the striatal dopaminergic neurons are very uh, high metabolic because they have an autonomic system. And to regulate the system, they require a high amount of energy. So whenever there is a block in the distance between the demand and the supply of oxygen and other nutrients, like maybe glucose, then these neurons are the first to get affected. So 
let's move on to our topic at hand, which is the role of insulin resistance and diabetes amongst Parkinson's patients. So in this picture, you can clearly see the cellular level biology of the receptors of insulin. And uh, to make it clear, insulin also targets the brain with GLUT4 receptors. And insulin has a lot of metabotropic or neurotropic functions in the brain. We generally have identified a few mechanisms or pathways through which insulin works. And one among them is, is the phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase pathway, which tends to activate or phosphorylate the tyrosine kinase pathway. And this is how insulin is uh, received or sensitized through the receptors. But in the case of aging, where neurodegenerative diseases are more common, both in the case of Alzheimer's, which is the most common, and Parkinson's, which is the second most common, we see a down regulation of these insulin receptors that you can see at the top left corner of the picture. There is a down regulation of these receptors, especially in the occipital region. I'm sorry, there is a upregulation in the occipital region, but there is a down regulation in the substantia nigra. And as you can see in the picture, it works through phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase pathway, but PKB AKT pathway is actually protective because it prevents the apoptosis of the mitochondria. As we all know, mitochondria is very important for us in terms of the cellular oxidation reactions. And in the case of Parkinson's disease, the complex number one is most commonly affected. And we can see that the mRNA of these dopamine, dopaminergic neurons are affected and they are downregulated, which leads to low production of dopamine and it leads to the movement disorders. Now we can see in this picture, a certain selective channel inhibitor, which is neuroprotective and a certain channel, which is neurodegenerative. So let's look into this further. The brain is very sensitive to insulin and glucose levels because as I said, it has high metabolic needs. Now, when we talk about a high fat diet or obesity or any kind of factor which can increase insulin resistance in an individual, we can see the upregulation of the neurodegenerative channel, which is PGCI alpha, which stands for peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma coactivator 1 alpha. So this receptor or channel, as you can see, is upregulated, which means there will be more accumulation of reactive oxygen species. And this leads to mitochondrial dysfunction and damage and the whole pathway that we talked about before we came here. The first picture is actually showing us uh, treatment modalities at different cellular levels and different receptor levels. As you can see, they have mentioned exenatide, metformin, theoglitazone, which are uh, different mechanisms of drugs that are used currently in diabetes. But as you can see in this case, that there is a neuroinflammation process which has begun. And this is due to the activation of TNF-alpha, IL-6, or IL-1, which are main mediators of inflammation. So these activate the microglia, which are considered to be the macrophage-like cells of the nervous system. And all of these uh, points, as we can see, checkpoints, are essential for us later when we are trying to figure out drug therapies. And this is just a picture to show you the different um, actors involved in this case of the pathway where the insulin resistance causes dysfunction of the mitochondria. And in the case of the insulin resistance, when we have apoptosis, we also have other factors such as increase in the gluconeogenesis or increase in the lipogenesis, which leads to increase of free fatty acids because of the breakdown of um, the fats due to the adipokines. And we can also see an increase in the inflammation, but not only limited to the brain. As you know that diabetes is a multicentric disease where different organs are targeted, whether it is the eye or whether you can consider the pancreas or you can even consider the muscles. Uh, these are the different checkpoints as you can picture where we will have insulin deficiency, 
and resistance in different types of diabetes. This leads to an increase in the inflammatory state of the brain. So this picture, as you can see, SNCA stands for alpha synuclein protein. It is actually related to PLK2, which is polo-like kinase 2. And this is also a degenerative protein, which is involved. So if we have a high fat diet or other kinds of factors which lead to the insulin resistance, the PGC I alpha is activated and this leads to increase in reactive oxygen species and this leads to a depolarization of the mitochondrial uh, polarizing membrane and in this case we can see PLK2 which leads to uh, alpha synuclein activation and when this gets activated it gets aggregated and when it gets aggregated it develops Lewis bodies. So this is the whole pathway through which it works. And now this is a study which is very interesting and it's been done a few years ago where 154 patients who are clinically diagnosed as non-diabetic Parkinsonian disease patients were tested uh, for their fasting blood sugar and insulin to help us understand uh, how the prevalence of insulin resistance or the trends of insulin resistance among such patients. So there were a lot of factors which were taken into account, be it metabolic indicators, motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease like we just discussed, the quality of life based on different scores and different index and indices which were used. So there was a popular formula called the HOMA index, which uh, leads us to get information about how many patients have a reduced uh, response to their own insulin, that is insensitivity or resistance as we call it. So their weight, height, everything was uh, noted and their cognitive performance was noted. In this case, we can see that about two thirds of the patient, about 60% of the patient had undiagnosed insulin resistance despite normal fasting, blood glucose and a normal HbA1c level which is giving us an idea that it's a precursor or has people commonly say that it's a type of pre-diabetes which leads to the actual disease in the future. So you can see that this data over here uh, confirms that this insulin resistance is more common among obese individuals than lean individuals. And there is a higher percentage of lean Parkinson's disease with insulin resistance, which means that in the case of Parkinson's disease, even if obesity is removed as a naturalistic factor, we can still see the increase of insulin resistance in lean individuals. So surprisingly, they did not find a correlation between the insulin resistance and the cognitive decline. Only the motor functions and the insulin resistance seem to be in sync with each other in terms of the trend. So the potential of the study is basically to identify whether weight gain and obesity as a new public health challenge is linked to body weight. So we can probably start screening people who are already diagnosed as Parkinson's disease with insulin resistance tests to identify and treat them on an earlier basis in order to manage it better. This next study, in this case, uh, has been a clinical trial where liraglutide, which is another uh, drug used in diabetes, has been used to identify whether there's any change in the management of such patients. And in this case as well, we have a lot of scores which were used, like people with dementia had the Mattis dementia scaling which uh, have which has a certain amount of scores in a certain scale. In this case, we also included severe depression and prior intracerebral surgical uh, incisions or interventions, along with concurrent medication. So what they found out in basic simplified terms is that administration of this drug actually improved uh, certain motor functions. And there were a changes in the non-motor symptoms as well. And these tests were done at 28 weeks and 54 weeks, which is a probable long time, about a year. So uh, these effects can be even considered to be long lasting. So 
There was also a change in the peripheral insulin resistance as measured by the HOMA IR index at both the points at the 28 week and the 54 week checkpoint. And in this case, we also determine the quality of life. And these signs clearly point to the fact that the early management of diabetes or insulin resistance using disease modifying agents can be very effective in creating a better quality of life for such patients, especially when it comes to them being dependent on other individuals for even their basic needs. So this study is actually a positive, sheds a positive light for us in order to look towards other sources of drug therapy, apart from the normal disease modifying agents for the substantia nigra itself or the increase of dopaminergic neurons. But this also helps us in the case of other comorbidities, such as uh, diabetes, as we were talking about. So coming up to the lifestyle modifications, uh, there was this paper which mentioned that every day, uh, an hour or two of exercise uh, for the early stage Parkinson's disease, people can help them uh, really overcome serious complications in the future. And this also involves dietary changes. As we know that the Mediterranean diet is considered to be the most clean diet in case of people with metabolic dysregulations. And this is just uh, a pointer in the same direction where individuals with such diseases are asked to make positive lifestyle changes, which includes both uh, motor changes in the sense of exercising and being more active or solving uh, questionnaires or solving puzzles or crosswords in the case of cognitive dysfunction and also eating healthy and clean. So this was the presentation. Thank you so much. And I am open to questions. Thank you so much for knowledge sharing, Dr. Sanovar. Yeah, we are Thanks having so a few questions for you. Yeah, if you can just okay, refer let to me the read. chat. Yeah. yeah. Can insulin resistance cause tremors? Yes, so as we already mentioned, uh, insulin resistance has a direct effect on the channel regulating pathway of PLK1 or in the case of PGCI alpha, and it causes the down regulation of PGCI alpha, which is a neuroprotective channel. It stands for peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma coactivator 1 alpha. And this helps us to reduce the reactive oxygen species. And when the ROS is increased in these neurons, it leads to uh, less production of dopamine. And as we know, this leads to the kind of tremors and akinesia and bradykinesia that we can see. So can reduce glucose tolerance, which has been recognized as a potential risk factor, or there's an increased scrutiny of insulin resistance, a pathological driver of neurodegeneration. Um, actually, there has been uh, proven clinical studies in terms of rats. Uh, I haven't included that in this presentation, the rat studies or the studies related to the mice, because I thought it would uh, not really be interesting for people who are not pathologists. So when a neurotoxin like MDDP1 was injected into the brains of such rats, we have identified after doing a few lifestyle modifications for the mice itself, that it is an actual factor which involves. So these mice have been fed a high fat diet for some time now. And after inducing this neurotoxin, which creates a Parkinson's disease like stimulation for the mice, uh, it also blocks the substantia nigra dopaminergic neurons. And in this case, we were able to see exactly how the neuroprotective channels were blocked and the neurodegenerative channels were upregulated, which leads to the ROS. So why milk can be related to PD? So there has been, um, there's not much information on this factor, except one thing that I read that can be a potential linkage to this answer. 
that is when we have increased of lysosomal storage diseases like in a person with an autosomal dominant or recessive form of lysosomal storage disease like maybe for example gaucher's disease where we have glucose hydrosidase uh, enzyme deficiency in this case we can see that um, products such as milk which can have an effect on the diet it causes a dietary impedance to the thing to the whole uh, metabolic dysregulation this can lead us to creating or consuming such uh, diet which is causing an impairment in such diseases so this kind of prion like movement of the parkinson disease is related to the lysosomal storage disease and that is why i think that milk is related as a risk factor even though there hasn't been any substantial information or shedding of light in this case So, can you name me which mitochondrial complex one inhibitor that is frequently used to investigate the pathological degeneration of neurons associated? So, I think uh, the answer for this it will be the rotenone and one methyl four phenyl uh, tetrahydropyridine. I'm not sure of the numbers which are included in this. I'm talking about the MT. MPTP, which is two well-known inhibitors of complex one, and as we can see uh, from the data from the experiments where these two chemicals have revealed a dose-response relationship between the molecular initiating event and the AO adverse outcomes. So these are the two um, inhibitors of complex one. can hyperglycemic patient and alzheimers are more prone to parkinson's disease um yes we have found i mean in my research i have found that uh it's both it's both ways it goes both ways in the sense that parkinson's disease individuals are more likely or susceptible to develop insulin resistance and insulin resistance or a hyperglycemic patient is more uh prone to develop alzheimers and um Parkinson's disease, both in the case of the molecular pathways and also the vascular changes which occur. So, yes, Dr. Shitish says thank you, and I have read milk yogurt cheese consumption may be associated with faster disease progression in Parkinson's. Yes, so that is what's been said, but about the pathogenetic mechanism, there is not much light shed. So I hope I've answered your questions. Are there any more questions?